We're back, and as I promised, with me in the studio is Mindy Klasky. Mindy, welcome back to Fast Forward. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Well, let's start by talking about your new book, When Good Wishes Go Bad. Now, it's the second in the set of books, the As You Wish series, That's right. and, we're, and Teal, the genie of the lamp, is back, but it's a different protagonist this time. Uh, that's right. With the As You Wish series, I decided to explore a new take on series. Um, instead of tracing one character all the way through three or five or however many volumes, um, I wanted to have a character who follows through, and as you said, that's Teal the Genie. Um, and Teal is a multifaceted character, so uh, using the genie to follow through keeps things interesting. Um, but the hero and the heroine, in a romantic sense, um, of each book is different. Right, and, and Teal not only Teal is multi multi-gendered, <laughs> multi anything. Uh, yes. And uh, and the the protagonist in this one is is Becca. Uh, Becca Morris. Right. Um, she is a dramaturg at a small theater in New York. Um, all of the uh, characters in the As You Wish series work in the professional theater. Right. Uh, in the first one, Kira was a uh, stage manager. That's right. And she shows up a little bit. She's like a background character. She has a cameo appearance yeah. in this one. And actually, she's the one that passes the lamp along exactly. to, to Becca. And Becca is a dramaturg. Yes. Let's talk about that, because I don't know if many people, I wasn't that sure. I'd heard the word, but I really wasn't that sure of what a dramaturg did. I think of the dramaturg as being the English major of the production. Um, they're the person who does all of the background research on what the time was like when the production was set. Um, they're also the person who is sort of the psychologist for the production, and they make sure that all of the egos stay in check as especially new plays are being developed. Um, dramaturgs also do um, research on current events that tie into the production. Um, they are sort of an all-around anchor. Some dramaturgs describe themselves as in-house critics for shows. And so if you think of all the different ways that a newspaper critic could write up a production, um, the dramaturg has already done that as the play is being developed. All right. Now, you had some fascinating research when you were finding out yourself about dramaturgs. And um, what, did, what did you do to, to find out what they do and what it's like? Um, I live in the Washington area, and I have season's tickets at several different theaters in town, um, including the Shakespeare Theater. And every single play I go to, I read the notes by Akiva Fox, literary associate. Um, dramaturgs have lots of different titles with different companies. And so I decided that I was going to contact Akiva Fox to find out what he or she did. I didn't know whether Akiva was male or female. And so I sent email to the Shakespeare Theater. I couldn't find Akiva's email address, so I just sent it to education at Shakespeare Theater. And within 15 minutes, I had an email back from Mr. Akiva Fox, um, who said that the novel sounded interesting and he'd love to help. And in fact, several of his dramaturg friends worked in town, people he'd been to school with. And so I ended up hosting three dramaturgs for dinner over at my house, um, getting information from them about how they work their jobs on a daily basis and uh, taking notes all through the evening. And a lot of what was discussed at that dinner ended up in my book. Um, what were what other, th other theaters were the dramaturgs from? Um, studio theater and Woolly Mammoth. Wow. Um, and the thing that makes that interesting is that uh, there was a complete spectrum of very traditional plays with the Shakespeare Theater mm -hmm. to extremely experimental works with Woolly Mammoth. And so hearing the dramaturgs talk about their jobs uh, really uh, gave me a full scope of what dramaturgs do. So, so what'd you fix for dinner? Um, well, they were vegetarian, or some of them were vegetarians. Um, so we had a uh, baked pasta dish and a very large salad and a lot of wine. <laughs> uh, one of the things I learned is that dramaturgs drink a lot. Ah, uh, and that did make it, 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 it into the book. It does fit into, into the book. <laughs> uh, so what kinds of things? I know one of the things that I found interesting in here were some of the ethical concerns that come up with Becca, particularly when she's looking for new plays and looking for financing and things like that. So um, One of the things that I was really struck by in talking to the dramaturgs are, uh, was their great concern about the ethics of their profession. 
Um, I was writing a comic fantasy romance, and to have a romance, there had to be a relationship between the hero and the heroine. And when the hero is a playwright and the heroine is a dramaturg, um, all sorts of ethical red flags start to go up. And we probably talked for about an hour at dinner about ways that my story could proceed and the dramaturgs could agree that it was possible, remotely possible, that it would happen. Have you heard from any of them since? Um, I sent them a copy of the book uh, last week, but I have not heard back from them yet. <laughs> be interesting to see what they, they say about it. I suspect that they will say um, she got a lot of things right and then there were things that were totally wrong, which is the way I feel when I watch legal dramas, having mm -hmm. practiced as a lawyer for several years. Yeah, there were a lot of things that were right, but that's not really the way law is practiced. Now, you mentioned the, the uh, hero of the book, um, Ryan Thompson, yes, who is a playwright. And his play, I found very interesting. Um, what led you to have, because this is a play about um, women in Burkina Faso mm -hmm. and, and, and the troubles they go through and, and what their lives are like. It's a, it's a very serious, heavy play. What had you, made you do this kind of a play in a light romantic <laughs> comedy? Because I don't like to follow the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the first book in the As You Wish series, which is called How Not to Make a Wish, uh, centers around a production of Romeo and Juliet. And it turns into an absolute farce of a play with things going, everything that you can imagine would go wrong and then some other things going wrong in the production. And in creating this book, I wanted to do something different with the play that they were staging. And so the first thing I thought of was, let's make it something serious. And as I was trying to figure out what the serious play would be about, um, there was a wonderful article that was in the Washington Post uh, that discussed the plight of women in African countries that are on the, where families are on the verge of starvation. And so social, cultural custom um, says that the women feed their husbands first and their children second, and then they eat whatever is left and often that is a handful of food in a single day. And that story stuck with me, and I realized that that was going to become the play that is at the center of When Good Wishes Go Bad. And a lot of the things are very interesting things in the book about getting the play produced, and the, the working the set, and the costumes, and even the, the floor of the stage. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there's also the, the conflicts between the playwright who has this picture in his head of what it should be and the director and the dramaturg and, and everybody else involved. Uh, I, I think that writers always have a different vision of their work than other types of artists have of it. Um, I'm having this discussion to some extent with the Hollywood studio right now, which is considering a production of my Jane Madison witchcraft books. And the treatment that I read of that had the same flavor as my books. It had the same characters. It had some of the same laugh lines and jokes. But there were other things that were completely different about it. And I understand that television is a different medium than books. Uh, and I think that I'm ready to accept that. Um, the production has not been greenlit yet, so I, I haven't needed to cross that bridge yet. Um, but th those feelings influenced Ryan's struggle to accept his vision of his play and the play as it is actually staged. Ah, so things are actually moving along, on because I think we spoke about that last time and it was just, just starting to happen. Um, there is one month left on the option and um, they, there are five stages to writing a, tele, a two hour television movie. And they have completed four of the stages and they have hired yet another new author to complete the fifth stage. And even as we speak, uh, that author is supposedly doing the final polish on the script. And which, you know, where, who's gonna be producing it? Or? Um, it is being produced, it is a joint production between Vast Entertainment and Dick Clark Productions. Um, it would be distributed by ABC Family oh, okay. um, if it goes forward. Uh, and at this point, it, it's still uh, up in the air as to whether it will go yeah, forward. But it's still pretty cool. <laughs> I, I'm excited about it. Yeah. I think it would be wonderful. And there could be more money. That's right, which is always <laughs> nice. And speaking of money, 
to, to get back to, to the book a little bit, the finance, you know, looking for the backers and yes. the financial, looking at that aspect of putting on a theater production, even for a, a fairly established theater, mm -hmm. was very interesting. And there's extra problems in the book because of Becca's, uh, her boyfriend at the beginning of the book. Uh, yes, her boyfriend, uh, most of my heroines start out with very bad boyfriends at earlier points in their life. Um, and this book opens with Becca's boyfriend uh, walking off with all of their joint savings account and several million dollars from the theater. And so when they go to stage Ryan's play, they have absolutely no money in the coffers to stage the show. Um, I knew that that was going to happen. I had worked all of that out when I'd been sketching my plot. But when I had dinner with the dramaturgs, one of them told me a story about going to a local embassy and trying to get the ambassador's staff to approve funding for a show that related to that country. And it did not go well. Um, it went horribly badly. And that's when I realized that Becca was going to have some challenges getting her financing. And she did. Yes. There is the going horribly badly <laughs> meeting with the uh, foundation. Yes. Um, and Teal, of course, helps mess that up. Uh, Teal always helps with yeah. everything. Yeah. And then they get their funding, and that was a very funny part of the book, is that they get them from this, like, popcorn uh, the Popcorn King. Yes. Um, the Popcorn King has decided that he's going to do for popcorn what Starbucks did for coffee. And we will all be able to get popcorn on every street corner in America. Um, the only problem with that is that the Popcorn King has taste buds unlike anybody else's anywhere in America. Um, and I had fun reaching out to some of my readers to get their suggestions for the terrible, horrible flavors of popcorn that the Popcorn King is going to present. And they, they are. There are some hideous flavors and hideous names of flavors yes. in it as well that he's going to have out at the opening of the play. And he also has them put his hideous logo on the, the popcorn, huts. The Popcorn King is all about orange and yellow. Yeah. Very bright orange and yellow. And he wants them to put it on the huts in Burkina Faso. Yes, yes. And T-shirts that and they're wearing. Um, he's not the easiest sponsor to work with. Yes, yes, yes. So um, as, as they're getting the play on, there's other things going on in the life. And Part of it is going on in New York. I mean, the pl it takes place in New York. What kind of research did you did about, do about living in New York? Um, I have visited New York many, many times, and most of the research that I did for this book was relying on my general familiarity with the city. Um, I always have maps open, and I try to figure out whether it's possible to get from point A to point B in this general time period. Um, I, in this particular case, needed to find a, an amazing apartment building down in uh, the village where Becca could live. Um, and I did a fair amount of browsing real estate ads looking for six rooms, river view, uh, and the perfect setting for, for the story to take place. And it's where Ryan lives with his mother. With his who mother. Who is a wonderful character. Uh, Ryan's mother, um, is, her name is Danny. Um, Danny is one of the gray gorillas, and they uh, do gorilla gardening throughout New York. I had never heard of this. <laughs> it really does exist. Yeah, it really and they, does they, exist. they make seed bombs. Um, they make seed bombs, mm -hmm. among other things, um, mixing up dirt and seeds um, that they let dry out, and then they go out on nights when it's going to rain, and they distribute their seed bombs to disperse the seeds and grow wildflowers in patches of earth that are otherwise bare in the city. Yeah, and they, they do fire escape uh, plantings um, and, and things like um, that. And plantings in the, on the sidewalk, the space between um, the sidewalk and the curb uh, where there's just bare earth. They take care of that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe you told me there is a tuckerization in the book. You um, might want to explain what that is. Um, there is a tuckerization. Uh, this was a fundraiser that I had done um, raising money for the group First Book, which um, buys first books for children who have never owned a book before. And I uh, had an auction of a tuckerization, the chance for somebody's name to appear in the book as a character. And a very, very generous woman um, donated a lot of money to First Book. Um, and um, her name became the name of Becca's assistant, um, Jen uh, Davis. 
And um, the more I wrote about Jen, I had to have details about her life. And so I went and did um, some research checking on my very kind donor <laughs> and found out that she was interested in cockatiels and that she was interested in Celtic knot work. And those are all details that got folded into uh, Becca's assistant. And it's it's a fascinating book, and there's you learn you, we learn a little bit more about Teal the genie in this too, because Teal has a what's called a boyfriend, girlfriend, a, a genie friend, a partner, I guess yes. is the easiest term <laughs> in this, which we didn't know before. And so I assume that as this series goes on, if it is a series, you know, there's a as you, this set of books progresses. Yes, the set of books progresses. We'll learn more about Teal and his genie life. That's right. Um, which it, which is very interesting as that as that grows. And the next book is um, the next book is called To Wish or Not to Wish. Um, and again, Teal is the continuing character. Mm -hmm. Becca has a cameo role, and then there is a new character who receives the the lamp and gets her wishes. Who is an actor? And she is an actor. And you also have another series that you have under contract, also for Mira. Yes. That was suggested by your editor, actually, and it's a different kind of romantic thing, which is about... Those tried and true characters, um, vampires, um, but this time um, we're taking a slightly different approach. Um, they are sort of patented Mindy Klasky, somewhat comic uh, vampires, and they all work in the night court in DC. Um, so there's ample opportunity for jokes about blood-sucking lawyers mm -hmm. and um, a, a lot of background on how the legal system works for these vampires who are doing some mundane legal work, but also a whole lot of vampire legal work. And these are gonna be, I assume, romantic. They're from Mira, and Mira is a, a uh, imprint from Harlequin. That's right. And um, are you planning on doing any other Harle regular Harlequin romance? Um, there may be one in my future. Uh, the, the traditional Harlequins are called category romances, and they range from very sweet to very spicy. And I have one in the works that is on the spicier end of things. Um, we'll see what comes of that. And the Night Court series, you, I think you're contracted for what, three books um, in that? Three are under contract so far. Um, the first one uh, will be in April of 2011. So. And um, the next As You Wish comes out? Uh, the next As You Wish comes out in October of 2010. That's great. Well, we'll all have to keep our eyes out for, for genies and vampires. <laughs> the, the, the streets are very, very odd. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to thank you. We're running out of time. I want to thank you once again for... Uh, coming back and visiting with us. We'll have you back on again, I hope. Thank you. I love being here. Great. And so, from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying, take care. <laughs>